Hello and welcome to the video. In this video I will be sharing my hoppy summer ale. With summer just around the corner it's time to start brewing up some thirst quenching ales and this one really does hit the spot. So as usual before we get our brew on let's have a quick look at that recipe. So here's the recipe for this one. Do keep in mind this is a small batch size and I would advise you use the reduced pipe work in your grain father for this one. This entire recipe is repeated in the YouTube description and is also stored in the grain father recipe creator database. This is certainly a light coloured but flavourful and hoppy summer beer. The yeast that I quote in this recipe is just a guideline. I'll talk more about this later. Okay so as usual we'll kick off by adding the grain into our strike water. What I did actually was I heated this up uh, using the Grainfather Connect timer and I find this a really handy function of that unit. So as you can see what I'm doing is I'm gradually adding in the grain to the mix and I'm giving it a good stir before I add any further. This is a totally essential process and something that you certainly shouldn't be rushing. All too often I see on YouTube brewers pouring in the entire amount of grain in one go and then stirring it up from there. Do not do this, this is very poor practice. Add it gradually, stir as you go and all will be good. Don't forget, this is the starting point of your efficiency after your grain crush. As you add more and more grain, you'll notice naturally that the consistency of your stirring is different. That's why it's very important as it gets thicker to start stirring it from the bottom, the middle and the top. Again, this is such an important part of the brewing process, I really cannot emphasise it enough. Once all of this is added, you should have a porridge-like consistency. It's now time to add the top mash plate and all of your connecting pipes before putting on your glass uh, lid and also the um, recirculation pipe. When you put the grain plate in, push it all the way to the grain and then give it a little lift. This will increase your efficiency. So I've now started my mash. Let's have a quick look at the schedule. So here you can see the first runnings of this mash. The mash schedule for this one is a very simple cookie cutter two step. 65 degrees C for 60 minutes and 75 degrees mash out for 10. Simple yet very effective for this style of beer. Here's a look at the same wart towards the end of mash out. I think you'll agree this is looking very nice and golden, perfect for the summer. Next up comes our sparge and this is a very important aspect of the brew and an area where you can certainly lose brew house efficiency if you're not careful. Notice that I'm putting a small amount of water in at each time and then I let it drain almost till it's gone before I add more. Another thing worth mentioning is a properly sparge beer always tastes better than an improperly or no sparge beer. So please, don't be lazy with this part, otherwise the taste of your beer is going to suffer. Sure, I get it, it takes a little bit more time, but hey, you're not having to do a manual full mash yourself, the grain father's taking care of that for you. So the way I see it is you can give your beer a little bit of extra love by sparging it properly. You know it makes sense. So while the mash was going on, I actually organised all of my additions, as you can see here, in time order, all labelled up and ready to go. I really feel that this level of simplicity and organisation is the bedrock of a successful brew day. Now there's a couple of additions that you'll see on the table there that I don't mention in the recipe. This is because I consider it a given 
that we would use certainly yeast nutrient in every brew and also any beer that needs any level of clarity as this one does we would also have an Irish Moss edition. Okay so we pick the brew back up here at the stage where it's just started to boil. So at this stage we've got all of this lovely foam on top and this is actually protein. So before we start the timer for the brew we're just going to stir this in. Please do note the motions that I'm using with my brewing spoon here. This is certainly a good way to get this all to disperse as quickly as possible. So you can now see that I've managed to get most of it to disperse and it's now time to add our first top addition and start the timer. It's also imperative that after you've added an addition that you give it a good stir in as you can see here. As the brew progresses you'll notice that this foam will start to accumulate on top further. Just give it a little stir in each time you notice it. The other thing that you're going to want to do periodically, and I would say about three times per brew on a 60 or 90 minute boil, this should be sufficient, give the bottom a good scrape. And the reason we do this is twofold. Firstly, you want to make sure that when you come to clean this, there's not an awful lot of crud on the bottom, uh, which could actually set the reset switch, and you certainly don't want to be having to crouch down and fix that back up. So we're fast approaching the end of the brew now and the thing that I do is I actually set up the counterflow chiller at this point so that I can run some boiling hot walk through it before we get to zero minutes because to me zero minutes equals whirlpool time. So all I'm going to do actually is run the wort through the counterflow chiller for a few minutes just to sanitize it all. But while I do this I actually set the timer to pause and I wait for the wort to get back up to boiling point and then I unpause the timer. One aftermarket addition that I've made to my grandfather brewing system is by adding on a Blickman thermometer. I do quite regularly get questions about this. And I'm going to answer the two most popular ones here and now, just to clarify it for people further. First and foremostly, this actual thermometer comes in two different sizes. The one that you're going to want if you're going to use it with a grain father is the one that is three-eighths of an inch. This fits perfectly, but I would recommend that you get some extra silicon hose for the exit side of this so that you can splash your wort into your fermenter in the way that I do to encourage better yeast health. The other question I get an awful lot is people saying to me, hold on David, you're using this with boiling hot wort, but Blickman themselves say that you should not do this. Well, my response to this is as follows. I've been using a Blickman thermometer now on my grandfather with boiling hot wort for 16 months. And I've brewed at least twice per month. The thing that Blickman are looking to protect here is actually the sticker that's on the front, which is very, very much like what you can buy in an aquarium store. Um, these are very cheap and a lot of homebrew stores sell them. Now, okay, I've noticed a little bit of bubbling on mine in places, but so far it hasn't affected its accuracy around temperature. So I will continue to use it until that becomes the case. And at that point, I will spend a little bit of money to buy one of these stickers and I will replace it. I don't really see there's any big issue here at all. Flashing ahead further now, it's now zero minutes and it's time to put our whirlpool hops in. Yeah, there they are. And you'll notice that I'm wearing brewing gloves because you know what? When you do these whirlpools, it really does get hot on your hands. It's not quite so bad with a small batch like this, but if you're fairly near the top, by God, you're not going to be able to stand that for too long. 
So invest in a pair of brewer's gloves. They're much thicker than the usual thick kitchen gloves that you can buy. And they will certainly protect you against that boiling hot wart which, yeah, the moment you don't wear them will be splashing all over your hands and arms. Be warned, it hurts. My technique is to whirlpool pool like this for 5 minutes, let it stand for 5 minutes and all is good. If you follow this technique, you will find that you won't have any pump problems whatsoever, no matter how many hops you use. This is the way to go. OK, before we go any further, I have quoted the yeast for this recipe as M36 Liberty Bell Ale yeast. But, actually, I'm not going to use that for this one. I certainly usually would, and it always turns out well. But not for this one. And the reason for that is I actually got a Facebook uh, message from a gentleman who was from a Norwegian farm that actually asked me if I would like to try his yeast. And I thought about this for a split second and I said yes please. The yeast that he offered me is one of these Norwegian kveik yeasts. And anyone that's familiar with my channel will know that I've done various videos highlighting this magic beans yeast more than a few times. And let's not forget that there are breweries now in the United States of America and other countries that are also now using this special yeast. The gentleman who contacted me goes by the name of Jens and I've put his full name on the screen here for you. The Kveika that Jens uses is from the Stordal region of Norway and is known as Ebergarden Kveik. Now the interesting thing about this particular variety of Kveik is that it's actually more than suited to very very hoppy beers, hence why I'm using it for this one. Usually that certainly is not the case. So I figured I'd try it in this one. So now we're all on the same page Let's get back to the brew. Now obviously if you're using regular yeast you won't have to do this. But what I need to do is actually have a pitching and fermentation temp for this kveik of 28 degrees C. So what I'm doing is measuring this the whole time and basically turning my cold tap on and off to make sure that I get close to this temperature. As is the tradition with quake yeast, what I did was I used my mash out wort to actually form a starter with this. This starter was held at just above 28 degrees C for the duration of the boil. This is an easy thing to do, just put the starter within water that is heated to the temperature. As you can see from this picture here, the starter had already started to ferment within the one hour boil time for this beer. Within an hour of pitching the yeast, this was the scene. This stuff really clumps together nicely. And like all Kveik yeast, it's shockingly fast. And within three hours, everything was going total bonkers inside there. This Kveik is certainly a steroid beast. Look at it go! By the time this yeast was going for 24 hours, it had already done half of the work. And generally speaking, these yeasts will ferment everything out within two to three days. Two days later, and this was the scene. So you can see that for the most part, the yeast has all dropped down. And actually we had a final gravity here of 1.015, which in terms of this Kveik yeast is time to bottle. Happy days! Instead of dry hopping this one, I actually used a hop tea. And this is what the two mixtures put together actually looked like when I actually bottled. Quite nice. As part of the bottling process for this one, I actually added a fining agent. And you can see this is actually just a day later and it's already starting to clean up rather nicely. This is certainly good to see, especially when you consider that there was some wheat that actually went into this brew. So there you go. It won't be long before I'll be drinking this one, of course, and because I use the Kveik yeast, generally speaking, this is going to be ready to drink in about a week's time. 
Like all of the recipes that I'm sharing here on my channel, this is a very tried and tested recipe. I've actually used dry American yeast with it, I've used the British type of yeast with that little bit of extra residual sugar, I've also used Belgian yeast with it, and whatever you pair this with, it certainly always works and works very very nicely. I've never tried uh, Quake yeast with it before, but I'm very intrigued to see what the end result will be of this. So there you have it. I do hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed brewing this beer and making this video. So if you did like this video then please do go ahead and like it on YouTube. This really helps me out and allows the videos to be seen by a wider audience on YouTube. I've got a lot of videos in the pipeline for the future so if you're interested in uh, seeing what I've got coming up then please subscribe for future content. If you have any questions on anything that I've covered in this video or in others or anything to do with brewing in general then please do not hesitate to get in touch. I'm more than happy to help. Until then, happy brewing!